and welcome to the debate. I'm your host, Anam Akul, with you at BTV World. In today's show, we will be talking about three very important topics, and the first, which gives all of us a lot of happiness, which, of course, is Pakistan's qualification for the final of the ICC T20 World Cup 2022 after winning the semi-finals today against New Zealand. And this was, of course, an important victory for Pakistan. Uh, fortunately, uh, that, of course, came to the semi-finals as well after lots and lots of prayers of the entire nation. And after this wonderful performance today, we saw that Pakistan has now qualified for the final of this ICC T20 World Cup. And we have great hopes, of course, uh, from our team uh, to be on the winning side at the final as well. Uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about this at the beginning and, of course, expressing our joy at what happened today and what we hope for coming in from the final as well. Our second segment is going to be focused on what has happened recently in terms of the Prime Minister's participation in the very important climate implementation summit held in Sharm el-Sheikh in Egypt. Um, and uh, the, his two-day participation in this particular event was of utmost importance to Pakistan, concerning, of course, that Pakistan is still dealing with the kind of devastation that had occurred as a result of the flash floods earlier this year. And so since then, Pakistan has been appealing its case, talking about climate change justice and what needs to be done in terms of bringing in loss and damage in the conversation and developing a finance facility for those countries who do not contribute as much to the global carbon emissions, but unfortunately um, are uh, suffering the consequences of climate change. So we're going to be taking a look back at what has happened in the previous two days, uh, what sort of representation has been done by Pakistan and moving forward, uh, what can we hope to achieve from the global conversation around climate change and then also specifically the kind of help that is needed at home. Lastly, we're going to be talking about what has been going on in Kashmir uh, since, of course, many, many decades. We've seen that human rights violations and abuses uh, keep on increasing and the kind of uh, uh, violations that exist within Kashmir, the, uh, uh, the highly militarized zone, of course, uh, is something which is of deep concern and add to the suffering of the Kashmiri peoples and asking for their legitimate right to self-determination since many decades now. And so we're going to try and see what this means uh, for the entire world as well, uh, when of course we see that the uh, Universal Periodic Review, which uh, works under the UN Human Rights Council, is due tomorrow and it's going to be uh, conducted by Nepal, Sudan and Netherlands. Uh, and this is going to be the fourth cycle, which is of course going to look back at the kind of recommendations that has that it has given in the past and whether or not they have uh, been upheld uh, by India and then moving forward what sort of issues need to be pointed out uh, the kind of human rights violations that exist and the kind uh, of recommendations uh, and uh, the kind of actions that India must take uh, in light of these human rights violations so it's going to be an important review of course but in terms of uh, what the previous reviews meant uh, how exactly will this one uh, be different and how will this help towards the cause of the Kashmiri people is a real question uh, since of course the kind of human rights violations that exist within the occupied territory is something where we are aware of that Pakistan of course puts forward at every platform but unfortunately we still don't see any change in the situation for the people of Kashmir so we're going to be talking a little bit about that at the end and trying to understand what should be done for that for this and more of course in the studios I've been joined by senior analyst Farooq Batafi and Raja Faisal and so we're going to be talking a little bit about cricket first before I welcome our guest for the first segment on climate change and the kind of impact that Pakistan has created uh, for its own cause as well. Um, so starting off with congratulations, I believe, are in order to uh, Farooq and Faisal and to the entire nation for yeah, this uh, uh, particular yeah. victory. Thank you very much. Um, and of course, I'm sure that we all spent our uh, holiday today watching this uh, wonderful match and uh, had a great time of doing so. Um, so Farooq, let's start with you. What was your experience like and what do you have to say about it? Brilliant cricket, Sanam. Uh, I think uh, after so many shocks that we have seen recently through throughout this tournament, uh, I think Pakistan parade played really well uh, and uh, one uh, happiness or one reason of happiness is the victory itself but the way our team uh, played was also a masterpiece mm. it was they performed like uh, a well-oiled machine our feeling was incredibly better our bowling has been great and it was great even now mm. and then our batters also really outshined everybody so if they continue like this, this is not ODI, this is T20 mm. World Cup. I think that if we can continue this kind of cricket in ODIs as well, we might be able to even sway or carry 
uh, the uh, ODI World Cup as well. Yeah. Absolutely. And Faisal, are you hoping for India's victory tomorrow? Because, of course, the final between Pakistan and India uh, will be a good watch. I know I am. <laughs> Sana, I am. And, of course, uh, who doesn't want Indo-Pak match uh, as a final? So everyone wants in Pakistan, me too. Uh, but when it comes to, obviously, England, England's team has been uh, performing really well in uh, recent mm. past. And we have seen throughout the World Cup, I mean, uh, they have displayed excellent cricket. And uh, we can expect uh, an excellent match tomorrow. Uh, we can hope that India wins. But uh, there are uh, chances that uh, England can knock them out. And I just wanted to tell you, back in 1992, of course, uh, same Australia, Pakistan versus England was the final and uh, Pakistan won. So we might be thinking about, you know, England gets in the final so that we can win it. Uh, here I wanted to mention one thing that uh, Pakistan is a team in the beginning, obviously, uh, first stages everyone written off and said that they should be starting uh, uh, start to book the tickets to go home. But now Pakistan is the very first team to get into the finals. Mm. So uh, it was uh, shocking for the world. And of course, it is an amazing uh, recovery by Pakistan. And the way Pakistan has come back, it was amazing. Here, I wanted to give credit to Netherlands as well. Because if Netherlands uh, you know, did not win that match against South Africa, then of course it would have been really Absolutely. hard. To there were lots of memes of I the kind of calculations yeah. required. Right. Yes, uh, regarding India, uh, hmm. of course, uh, one wants uh, that electrifying cricket yeah. where India and Pakistan play, and that is always such a treat. So I will be hoping that they hmm. succeed. Uh, but no matter who server plays with Pakistan, what I enjoyed, and it was a hmm. bit ba baser instinct, I tell you today, hmm. uh, to see uh, the uh, New Zealand team under pressure. Mm. When our team actually plays well, it mm. really plays well, right? Mm. Incredible cricket. And the great thing was that our captain, who had not been batting that well uh, until now, mm. has suddenly picked up pace. And that actually transformed the experience. Mm. I think that uh, whosoever uh, faces Pakistan, whether it is UK or whether, uh, sorry, England or whether it is uh, India, they are going to be in for a treat. The mm. only thing is, this analogy of 1992, we are perhaps some of the few people who want to always live in the past. Mm. Why not live in the future? Mm. Uh, let us play cricket better than 1992. Right. Yeah. And let us uh, make more records. One liner, Absolutely. one liner. Uh, yes, Sana, one very liner. Yes. Uh, <laughs> here, on a lighter note, mm. I would request FIA Cybercrime Unit you know, to pick up everyone who's been on social media criticizing the opening pair of Pakistan because today they have been marvelous and they have actually, you know, uh, splendidly uh, given they a message to if all of these. If, if well. it is a lighter note, I don't want to crack jokes. <laughs> <laughs> right, absolutely. <laughs> all right, that's all that we have from this particular <laughs> segment. But of course, we have great hopes for the final <laughs> and we're glad to have made it to that. So whoever is our opponent, of course, is in for a treat and a tough time too, hopefully. And we are, of course, everyone, the entire nation is hopeful for a victory. Moving on, of course, we're going to be talking a little bit about the very important climate implementation summit recently held, of course, still going on in Sharm el in Egypt, in which Pakistan participated for two days. Uh, for this and more uh, and of course the kind of conversations that are required globally around climate change and uh, Pakistan's of course input in this and then also in terms of what uh, we hope to, br uh, to bring in the country in terms of the kind of assistance that is required. We've been joined online uh, by uh, Dr. S.M. Adi, adjunct professor at John Hopkins University. Thank you very much uh, for joining us and being part of the debate, Dr. Ali. Um, I'll start with you, considering, of course, that the, the, the COP27, of course, was an important uh, uh, summit uh, and is an important platform in terms of having this conversation. A major aspect of what was uh, very important to Pakistan was the conversation around loss and damage and uh, the establishment of uh, some sort of financial infrastructure around how we're going to be bringing about um, uh, this uh, particular assistance or help coming in from those who are contributing more to global carbon emissions uh, to those who are suffering more. Um, how do you see uh, the conversation so far held, especially when we take into account Pakistan's stance of climate change justice? 
And whether or not when we move forward, of course, there's a good aspect of a small victory of uh, the fact that this uh, was even part of the agenda, which wasn't there before. But moving ahead, this, this seems to be quite a complicated uh, scenario where we're, we're going to have to figure out exactly how will this pan out or what sort of distribution channel is going to be uh, required and what sort of infrastructure will be there. How do you hope coming in from these conversations that we'll actually be able to materialize all of that? Well, um, Sana, I think you've really picked up on, uh, on the essential points here. You know, and, and to put this in context, really, you see the emphasis so far on climate change has been on um, adaptation. It's not that the world has done a great job. We are not, uh, you know, going to be meeting the 1.5 uh, emissions, uh, sort of a global warming target based on the current emissions. But so far, the emphasis has been to turn the tap off, as it were, right? But, you know, the em now the growing emphasis on loss and damage, what that implies is that, hey, climate change is not something that's going to happen in the future. It is something that is already upon us, and it, it has already been upon us for quite a while now. So we are already living in, as academics uh, have been uh, calling this, the age of uh, adaptation. Right, so Pakistan has uh, been at the forefront, I mean, particularly this year in terms of uh, damage. And the interesting thing is that, you know, this is the first time in the history of, of the UN climate summits, I mean, we're now at COP27, right, where the parties and the negotiations have reached some consensus, basic consensus, that they want to include a discussion on loss and damage, right? So that is an accomplishment, the fact that Pakistan is heading it, uh, spearheading it for the G77, the group of poorer countries, is important. However... Right, uh, right. Uh, Dr. Ali, you, uh, you can finish the thought, but I just wanted to add one more question regarding Pakistan's concerns, regarding floods and climate change. Pakistan's only concern it, uh, is not uh, loss and damage. Uh, transition uh, to uh, climate-friendly technology and also adaptation. These are also very serious concerns Pakistan has. Is it not true? It is, I think, but their adaptation is of more urgency for Pakistan, you know, because of the fact that there's this kind of, you know, chaos theory at work and the irony that, you know, emissions come from one place and they can have the most adverse effects in other places, right? So, I mean, if you look at Pakistan's ecological footprint, it's not much. I mean, not that there was a lot of environmental conscientiousness in Pakistan, but, but because we have such a minuscule economy in, in terms of, uh, you know, the global scale of things. However, adaptation emphasis is important because it is saying for whatever reasons, Pakistan is a, in the hot seat and it needs to adapt. I don't think that the, trans of course, you know, all countries eventually need to transition. But if you look at Pakistan's ecological footprint, even if the whole country is full of solar panels, you know, which would be good in its own right, uh, you know, what, what good would that do in terms of curbing global emissions? You know, because our footprint is so small. So I think that, you know, th that discussion on capping emissions should be had, you know, by the major fossil uh, producing countries, by countries which have a very he heavy ecological footprint, uh, which includes India now, includes China, and of course the US and the rest of Europe. Because even India and China, while they are the leading emitters, if you look at a per capita uh, ecological footprint, theirs is lesser than even European countries. Right, so and absolutely, Dr. Ali, of course, this, this is important in terms of uh, the, the fact that when we're dealing with climate change, uh, then that has to be something that the, the kind of global action that is required is there. Um, and of course, our input uh, is important too, but if we're going to be having to deal with the consequences of climate change, we'll need that sort of global action uh, to compound that as well. But considering, of course, the, the way that the international community is also dealing with other issues that seem to unfortunately always take pri priority, um, there is, of course, uh, the kind of economic conditions that we're faced with, the kind of food security issues uh, in, the in the aftermath of the Ukrainian crisis or a post-pandemic age or whatever issues uh, seem to have 
more uh, urgent action or a, a sense of urgency than unfortunately uh, perhaps this very urgent issue as well. Um, that sort of also influences the way that this response is going to work. So when we take a look at the kind of window that we have in terms of maximizing the output for ourselves, um, it seems that it's important for us to also follow up more proactively towards getting that help. Uh, we had a number of pledges coming in right after the devastating floods, but it, the kind of distribution or the kind of follow up perhaps that is required for that did not happen. How much do you think Pakistan can actually plan or strategize in terms of uh, capitalizing on these pledges and commitments and actually making sure that we, we have some sort of benefit coming into the country? And COP27, uh, do you think that it was uh, uh, you know, a helpful, quite helpful kind of uh, platform for Pakistan to uh, uh, Prime Minister of Pakistan, he interacted with uh, uh, other uh, obviously heads of state as well. So can we say that this can be a good help uh, for Pakistan to make its case? Again, go, going back to sort of, you know, the, this platform now and loss and damage. Now the problem is that the, while this platform has this agenda item has been created, the, the you know, the ability of, uh, of the discussions therein to finger point at countries which are solely responsible or largely responsible in terms of payment, in terms of determining liability, that has not been decided. And there will be resistance by richer countries which have been you know, uh, producing these heat trapping gases since the 1850s you know, to, to, be, uh, to become subject to unlimited liability. So I think there, there is going to be simultaneous pushback However, there is growing pressure, you know, so last year when Scotland hosted this event, it, it, I think it was the only country which, you know, pledged a, a couple of million dollars. This year we see countries like Austria and Ireland, apparently China is also thinking of contributing to loss and damage, and that will create more pressure, right, on the industrialized world to make those commitments. However, you know, there is a difference between commitment and actualization. So if we go and look at the um, global climate facility, which, you know, did not get anywhere near the kind of money that it needed because of these contending concerns, right? I mean, there's uh, chaos and a chaotic global environment with a lot of different types of needs, but climate is exacerbating those threats, right? So mm -hmm. there is that realization However, uh, you know, those, the modalities for loss and damage need to be clearly worked out and they need to be worked out in a way that, you know, poorer countries with limited sort of, you know, bureaucratic capacity can get these funds in an expedited manner. So if you look at right. the global climate facility, Pakistan has, you know, it, it has taken months and months and months of negotiation and we have not been able to see much of that money come through for adaptation purposes thus far. So one hopes that, you know, with loss and damage, if there is actual commitment and there is some semblance of liability, that those mechanisms will also be, you know, will be uh, such that we'll be able to see some of that desperately needed resource, you know, trickle down to the ground level. Right. Uh, Dr. Saab, uh, let me actually take you back to what you said regarding creation of liability. I understand that liability, especially if it is fixed historically, it can cause a lot of problem for the developing country. I'm not particularly married to the wording of the whole problem, whether it is reputation or some kind of fund or creation of fund uh, to mitigate the circumstances. I'm okay with that. Is there a possibility that we don't get uh, bogged down in the language uh, and uh, there is creation of this kind of fund? Secondly, also, usually whenever these bodies or such concerns are created, they can be accused of micromanaging countries. Uh, sir, um, uh, you know, G.B. G. B. Shaw once said uh, that I can uh, forgive Sir uh, Alfred Nobel for, uh, you know, inventing dynamite, but I will never forgive him for uh, you know, introducing Nobel P uh, Peace Prize. So do you think that there's still a possibility that that kind of uh, repercussions could also kick in? Well, uh, so firstly, the issue of liability, the liability is not, uh, here I'm not talking about 
you know, liability for developing countries, you know, because the, the whole idea of the Paris Agreement was that all countries are going to determine their own targets. So it, this is not that kind of liability. The liability for loss and damage is the liability that the developed world owes to developing countries. And they are very reluctant to take on that liability, right? Because that's opening up a Pandora's box, given the mutations of, uh, you know, of implications that climate change brings about. I mean, conflicts uh, in Lake Chad, uh, you know, I mean, it, it's got so many different, uh, you know, then uh, brings up so many different challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so, so that is one point. The second point is that, uh, yes, these, you know, I mean, but you have, there needs to be a balance between accountability because we also know that corruption, nepotism, those are also concerns, but it can't be so bureaucratic like the global climate facility that that money actually, because we can't uh, dot the T's and cr cross the T's and dot the I's that that money actually never materializes. So there needs to be a balance and that's where the proactivity needs to happen, right? Where countries like Pakistan should be at the forefront. Uh, right. And um, I, I think lastly, uh, you know, yes, it was a chance for Pakistan to go and interact with a lot of countries. We even engaged with the uh, uh, Middle Eastern uh, Green uh, Initiative. Pakistan has offered, you know, uh, services and Pakistan has been offering human resources to the Gulf countries for decades now in doing so for reforestation. However, also consider the, uh, the ironies, right? I mean, the, the Middle East Green Initiative, I mean, is coming from countries which are the largest producers of right. fossil fuels. Yeah. I mean, what it, do you make of that initiative, by the way? What do you make of that initiative? I mean, it, it, it's not to say that reforestation, obviously, it, it is useful, but we need to get away from fossil fuels. I mean, globally, Pakistan is, you know, a drop in the bucket. But, I mean, the Gulf states are providing, you know, oil, fossil fuel to the rest of the world. That's how they build their wealth. And they really need to wean off. I mean, that is the idea, right? But the ways in which you do this, the devil also lies in the details. So, for, for instance, if you look at carbon offsets, I mean, carbon offsets, it's a market mechanism. But sometimes how carbon offsets happen can be quite problematic, right? So this idea that... Uh, company, multinational company, which has a large ecological footprint, can keep doing what it's doing for now. And while it transitions to greener energy, it's paying poorer countries to put up forests. But often you see, you know, the haphazard way in which this happens and the top down way that it happens, you can actually see poorer people being displaced. It can turn into a man versus nature kind of a debate, right? So Absolutely. Careful on, on yes. those issues as well. And, and these are, of course, important concerns and important contradictions that we, of course, uh, already earlier have also seen in, in COP27 and perhaps other summits as well that have been uh, sponsored by such companies as well who don't really have that sort of commitment. Uh, but in terms of uh, what you earlier said, uh, the difference between a commitment and an actualization, of course, that's important. But when we talk about whatever conversations are happening and the kind of response that we require from the entire world, of course, the, the beginning can be from a conversation, but in terms of actually holding uh, that pledge or commitment uh, and making sure that that actually happens, where will that accountability come from? Uh, will that come from such platforms? Will that come from international opinion? Um, how can countries like Pakistan also ensure that this is something uh, that we can then talk about in terms of uh, whether or not it has happened? So when we take a look at uh, these summits, of course, this is the 27th uh, such summit. There have been numerous discussions in the past as well. Have we even moved any closer to actualization of any commitments that, that have been made in the past? Or uh, how, what sort of contribution do you think that these conversations can have towards that accountability that is needed for implementation? In the next 10 days, we will have <coughs> clear, clear actual commitments made I mean, so far, uh, you know, the discussion, and I think the, the UN General Secretary is also behind this idea of a debt swap, I think, which might not be a bad thing, where Pakistan doesn't have to pay off all the debts it's, uh, you know, um, uh, accumulated and can invest some of that money specifically for rehabilitation and recovery. 
I think that would be very useful. Uh, there has been, not in loss and damage, but there's been discussion of a creation of something like a $30 billion fund, especially for poorer countries, uh, which will be financed uh, you know, by multilaterals, but also by corporations like Microsoft, you know, wants to pitch in for that for early warning systems. I mean, Coca-Cola has also, I mean, it, it's been uh, one of the major sponsors of COP27, which has brought about its own criticism that Coca-Cola is the largest producer of plastics globally, mm. right? And it is trying to get, so, you know, is, is that greenwashing or is that showing a change of heart? Uh, you know, is, um, you know, is uh, uh, still debatable questions, but I think in, in a, a nutshell, uh, I think we will, in the next week or so, we should be, the situation should be clearer in terms of, you know, dollars and cents and how, what's going to come into Pakistan in the immediate future. Uh, and and uh, Dr. Ali, if uh, obviously uh, uh, the world has expectations from all of the countries and Pakistan has always been compli in, in compliance with that, of course Pakistan always uh, had uh, uh, carbon emissions less than 1%. We keep on talking about it. And uh, we have been following, uh, you know, all of the guidelines as well from uh, uh, the world which they gave us. We have been responsible enough. But don't you think that it is responsibility of the world that uh, they have to ensure uh, that as soon as Pakistan faced this, uh, these floods uh, out of uh, climate change, then it should have been on the urgent basis. And uh, so far, we didn't get that kind of response. And it is kind of late of uh, the rest of the world to give us that response. Well, Pakistan has not been compliant. I mean, if you look at the Ravi mm. River, it is the most polluted river in the world. We have, uh, you know, we have uh, used up our groundwater without any regulation to the point that our aquifers are under threat. Uh, mm. If you look at pollution in Lahore, you know, I, I, I don't think that we, you know, and, and if you're talking about the floods, look at the encroachment on the embankments, right? I mean, look at the urban development projects. I mean, this big idea of building something around the Ravi River. So I don't think that Pakistan has been compliant. Our disaster mechanisms are pathetic, especially at the local level. But it is still unfair for the world to point a finger at a country, you know, which has less than 1% of the ecological footprint but that is not because of our conscientiousness. Yes, we planted trees, but there's so much else that Pakistan could have done right, right? But it, they still can't point the finger at Pakistan because the problem, the scale of the problem is much broader than what Pakistan has done. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Dr. Ali, for joining us and being a part of this conversation and sharing very important views, of course, regarding the conversation around climate change. We'll take a short break here and be right back. Welcome back to the debate. Uh, we're, of course, going to now be moving on to our third segment in which we're going to be talking about what unfortunately has been happening in Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, this, of course, has been uh, one of the worst uh, uh, human rights violations that have been happening uh, for so long. Um, and then, of course, uh, with regards to the kind uh, of uh, struggle that the Kashmiri people have put up for so many decades, that is, of course, commendable. But in terms of the abuses that the people have suffered, and the way that the situation has deteriorated, we'd like to take a look at what has been going on in the Indian occupied valley for quite some time now, just to get a picture of what is happening and then what is important in terms of the universal periodic review. Let's take a look at this package and we'll be right back.
India, which is the largest secular democracy of the world, has been under the strict scrutiny of the international human rights organizations and other concerned bodies. And with every passing day, the findings of these organizations give harsh blows to the gregarious claims of India being a true democratic or secular entity. People of Kashmir had rendered unparalleled sacrifices for securing their inalienable right to self-determination. India's escalating repression of Kashmiris has rendered Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir as the most dreaded prison of the world. India is one of the states to be reviewed by the UPR Working Group during its upcoming session, taking place from 7th to 18th of November, which marks the beginning of UPR fourth cycle. During the third cycle of UPR in 2017, India was handed over 250 recommendations to improve its human rights record. India accepted 150 52. India has failed to uphold its commitments and make progress in any of the areas of concern. Despite strong protests from human rights organizations, including the United Nations and the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, the Indian government has failed to address the key human rights concerns expressed during Third Universal Periodic Review. In the recent development, all parties' Hurriyat conferences, constituent organizations have said that the Kashmiri people must remain vigilant to ensure that no person and group should dare to come forward to cooperate with the Bharatiya Janata Party-led Indian fascist government to further the Hindutva agenda of right-wing RSS in the territory. Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir remains world's most militarized zones where Kashmiris are facing an unending ordeal of terror and trauma. Hence, United Nations must conclude its review in accordance with information in the reports of independent human rights experts and Kashmiri freedom groups. Well, you heard the report and of course uh, this means that this is an important review that is going to be held tomorrow by Nepal, Sudan and Netherlands under the UN Human Rights Council. And this universal uh, periodic review working group is uh, of course something that has recommended and analyzed the situation in the past as well. This will be the fourth cycle. But of course the important question again uh, depends upon what exactly will be the consequence of this uh, particular review. How exactly will the world be able to ensure that the recommendations are followed and that India is at the end of the day held accountable for the human rights violations and abuses that are going on in the territory because unfortunately uh, since decades we have seen that this has continued to happen. Um, before we of course uh, begin the conversation around what is uh, going to be the result of this uh, particular review, it's important to also look at where we stand now and how far uh, the Kashmiri struggle movement has also come in. Uh, starting uh, from uh, many, many years ago to the kind of unilateral decisions that came about in 2019 and then to the demographic changes that have happened and of course uh, the kind of draconian laws that now exist in one of the most militarized zones of the world. For this and more, let me also welcome in the show a senior Hurriyat leader, Mr. Altaf Senwani, who's joined us online. Thank you very much, uh, Vani Saab, for being with us and being a part of the debate. Let me start with you in terms of the kind of resilience that the Kashmiri uh, struggle has shown in the wake of such atrocities. Um, it is, of course, quite admirable, uh, and generations have, of course, uh, uh, faced this uh, particular uh, problem with reference to what is going on within the territory uh, by the Indian occupation forces, and unfortunately, they shouldn't have had to. But when we take a look at what has happened internationally and the kind of conversations around what is going on in Kashmir, it's important to understand the significance of the Universal Periodic Review to the Kashmiri struggle movement. So in your opinion, when you take a look at how the, the world has responded or taken up the issue of the Kashmir, uh, Kashmiri struggle, uh, what exactly do you think is going to be the significance of the review tomorrow and in light of what has had been uh, the previous reviews and how much they have impacted the Kashmiri struggle. What sort of benefit do you hope for and do you think can be possible from this? Uh, thank you, Sana, for having me. Uh, let me tell you, uh, the last three cycles of UPR, which I have witnessed personally and have been part of those UPRs and have submitted parallel reports to all these UPRs, uh, the UPR process, which was initiated back in 2006 when the Human Rights Council came into existence, it was a thought that it will be a better uh, mechanism in order to scrutinize the human rights uh, situation of the member states of the United Nations and thereby 
uh, promote and protect human rights universally. But what we have seen uh, when India, when I talk of, about Indian UPR, in, in, uh, in your report you told that in, uh, in the last third cycle of UPR, India was handed over 252 uh, recommendations. She accepted 152. Uh, but uh, looking at the graph which uh, different organizations have maintained, only five of the recommendations out of 52, India has uh, uh, to somehow implement it, and that too are about uh, that transgender and uh, lesbian and gay rights. That is the only thing where they have moved forward to something. On the other things they have not done, they have not moved a single inch. They, they even did not note some of the uh, recommendations from the council. I, I knew that there are two parts of the international uh, pressure. That's one is civil society. Civil society, uh, all the civil societies, even just during this fourth cycle of UPR, more than 200 international civil society groups have submitted their parallel reports calling for the government of India to improve its human rights record, calling on government of India to, uh, to ratify the Convention Against Torture, Convention Against Enforced Disappearances, repeal Armed Forces Separation Power Act, uh, Public Safety Act, uh, and National Security Act, and also abolish death penalty and also uh, ratify the optional protocols of the civil and political rights and economic and social cultural rights. But unfortunately, what we see, uh, India is not, India accepted these things but has not um, uh, implemented any of these things. Uh, what we saw from the international community, which we call the member states and the observer states in the council, they put some questions to the government of India. They have asked the government of India again these questions, but there is no pressure from these. And this mechanism, to me, has failed to make any of the country accountable for its time. It's not talk of India. The India is the most arrogant country which I have seen in the council. The Indian Solicitor General in the third UPR was on record telling to the council that we don't need any external advices. We have our own mechanisms and all that. And India did not allow even a single special reporter. It, India was asked to facilitate the visits of special reporters to, who have uh, already requested government of India to give them access to India and the Indian occupied Kashmir to assess the situation. But in last four and a half years, India did not allow a, a single human rights uh, special reporter to visit uh, the India or Indian occupied Kashmir. Similarly, India did not ratify any of the conventions which uh, she had already committed. And also, the government of India enlisted uh, more, make, made more stringent the UAPA and used it against the political uh, opponents, political dissidents, human rights defenders, and journalists across India and especially in occupied Juma and Kashmir. I was going okay. through detail of that, all, how many Indian uh, human rights defenders, political leaders of uh, different ethnic and religious groups who have been uh, put behind the bar for raising voice for their rights. Uh, we, now we see that people are dying in the jails because of being not provided the facility. Exactly. So, so this is the Indian government. Yeah. Yeah, one is of one is of when when we talk about obviously UPR, this review report, of course, uh, uh, when it comes to Kashmir, do you not think that it should be, uh, you know, a separate report rather than uh, having the whole India's report? Because if we talk about India, the rest of India uh, situation out there is very different. But when we talk about Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir, of course, it is. Uh, most militarized zone number one and number two there is no media access even the social media is barred and uh, we do not get any uh, you know updates from within so it would not be possible to uh, have uh, the same sort of terms and conditions of UPR for Kashmir Indian illegally occupied Kashmir as well and if we talk about India uh, uh, at large of course, UPR has been finding out that there are, uh, you know, so many anomalies within the system that are allowing, uh, 
racism, number one, and number two, uh, of course, uh, you know, extrajudicial murders are out there. Everything is happening in today's India. And of course, we know that against Muslims, against Christians, Sikhs, uh, Dalits as well, Dalits, they consider themselves as Hindus. But when you talk about uh, Kashmir and Jammu and Kashmir, of course, that is entirely a different uh, side. And there should be a separate mechanism that ensures that, uh, uh, you know, India is in compliance with it. You uh, see, uh, this is a very good thinking that there should be a separate uh, 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 report for it. But unfortunately, under UN uh, systems, there is uh, no provision for that at present. Uh, unfortunately for us, it's also that during this fourth cycle of UPR, we do not have the Kurum Parvez or, or any of the civil society actors being allowed in Indian occupied Jammu and Kashmir to, to document or to send the information to the UPR processes or to the UN special repertoires. It was because of uh, this, you could see only one submission from the Kashmiri groups to this uh, 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 this time to the uh, stakeholder summary. That is from the Kashmir Institute of International Relations because all the uh, civil society actors in occupied Kashmir who would report to the UN, who would document the human rights violations, who would see all this, they are behind the bars or their offices have been closed and they are facing the reprisal at the hands of the Indian government. Uh, the, the UN special rapporteurs and all those have made a huge hue and cry. They have written a number of communications to the government of India on these. But unfortunately, the United Nations Human Rights Mechanism is, uh, what I always say, is a toothless body. They don't have the teeth to bite. The teeth to bite lies in the Security Council. They lie in the General Assembly, where oh. the weak powers, they, they have just used the human rights as a pretext for their own purposes. When it comes to Ukraine, they can, in, uh, they can uh, put sanctions on Soviet Union. But when it comes to Kashmir, for the last 70 years, India has occupied it, India has invaded it, India has illegally invaded it, but there is no accountability Excellent. for India. Uh, this yeah. is this is always, I, I always speak even on the podium of the UN that uh, this UPR process uh, is like you scratch my back, I scratch your back. The countries yeah. just, just they ask the, uh, the, mm, the member state that you should do this, you should do this, because all this process is legalistic, that you have to improve your legal frameworks for different kinds, for different sections of society, for the child rights, for the civil and political rights, for the rule of law and all that. So you have to make the uh, legal recommendations. But when it comes to implementation, India doesn't even move on those legal recommendations. You, you may be amazed that from 1992, uh, uh, India says that uh, we are uh, looking at the Convention Against Torture because uh, Convention Against Torture, uh, the torture is the basic uh, for all the human rights violations that are being perpetrated anywhere or in uh, Indian occupied Kashmir or in the mainland India. That's why India doesn't uh, ratify it. But they take the plea that it's in our parliament, our parliament will pass it with reservations with this and that, but they have not passed it. It's from 1992 right. in the Indian parliament, but the Indian parliament doesn't pass it. So this is the way of the way that at the same kind when the Indians accepted the resolutions on Kashmir and then uh, they, uh, on one hand, they submitted their uh, occupation in military occupation in Kashmir and then started calling Kashmir an integral part. The same yeah. thing India is doing at United Nations. They say, okay, we accept this, we accept this, this is okay, we note this. But at the end, when the Indian uh, response comes, uh, from the top hierarchy of India, they say we don't need any external advices. We have our own mechanisms to deal. So this is time for the international community. If a country has its own mechanism to deal with things, why she is a part of the United Nations Human Rights Council? Why she right. is part of the global body? That she should be kicked out of this. Unfortunately, there is a mechanism for this. That if a country doesn't comply with the UN systems, its membership should be kept. So but that hasn't so happened. One is a, uh, I, uh, one question from me as well regarding, uh, you know, uh, the whole Kashmir debate. I understand that uh, a part of it is uh, regarding the UN systems and how it approaches the matter. The other one, of course, is how India's institutions keep on failing to protect people. Uh, and that's why we, we are seeing these reports. One mm. we are going to see tomorrow. 
let me ask you regarding uh, India's pivotal institution of judiciary, because you were talking about legalistic system. Uh, Indian judiciary has failed to take up the matter of abolition of Kashmir's identity uh, for past three years. Yeah. And now, uh, let me ask you, uh, today we have seen change of guard at India's Supreme Court. Uh, Justice Chandrachur uh, has taken over, and he is going to be there for two years, and he is considered to be very conscientious and a very vocal man. Do you think that there is a possibility that there might come some kind of reset in the system? Uh, to be very honest, and if uh, from the BJP is there for last, uh, uh, I think eight nine years, is there in power, and they have converted each and every institution uh, to their own uh, mindset. Each and every constitution is run by, or uh, they are being guided by the Hindu uh, ideology. Be that judiciary, be that military, be that executive, and other things. But uh, having said that, I have seen the Indian judiciary not never been uh, sympathetic to people of Indian occupied Kashmir. Uh, you can go back to late 80, 84 when Mahmud Bhatt was hanged in a false case, and then uh, when uh, Abdul Guru was hanged, and the Indian even in the Indians uh, at that time Chief Justice in the verdict said that there is no circumstance evidence against him, but in order to satisfy the general conscience of the people of India, he has to be given the highest. So when it comes to the Kashmir, Indian judiciary has its different uh, attitude. When it comes to the Kashmir, they take a different sides. And uh, you, you see from last three years, they are not hearing a case on Kashmir. Uh, of, of Article 370 and 35A and others. And when it comes to the other things, they are they, uh, just swimming in right. and they uh, take so more to action. Uh, Wale sahab, unfortunately, we're out of time, but thank you very much uh, for you. speaking with us and sharing your views and, of course, uh, being a strong voice uh, for the people of Kashmir. And uh, the struggle, unfortunately, continues, and we really hope uh, that we see some sort of consequence to what is going on within India and that the uh, review tomorrow contributes towards an international response uh, that is appropriate to what is going on. That's all that we have uh, from the debate. Thank you.